Hello there, I'm Charlotte Connolly and I'm the Museum Curator at the Polar Museum and today I'm joined by Lindsay Holmes. Now Lindsay, you worked with us a few years ago on a project about the Snow Queen. Perhaps you could introduce yourself and what you do and tell us a bit about that project. Hi Charlotte, yes, so I am a textile slash costume artist. Um, I use the medium of dress normally to tell stories. Um, so I'm often linking with original dresses in museums, but then adding different elements to them to tell stories and they're normally very interactive and hands on. Unlike a lot of artwork, pretty much everything I make is designed for the public to touch, try on, go around in, um, you know, get really involved in the kind of tactile nature of it. Um, and in fact, the Snow Queen we told was the exhibition that first um, had me working with the Polar Museum. There was an, uh, a poet in residence at the same time, um, Caddy Benyon, who um, uh, was writing some beautiful poems um, based on the Snow Queen. And I was an artist in residence over the road, Anglia Ruskin. And I came in just to kind of uh, I can't even remember, I think it might even have been for another kind of meeting about something else costume related um, and met Caddy and um, it turned out we were both um, working around the same theme. Um, so the wonderful staff at the Polar Museum saw an opportunity and it ended up being um, uh, taking over the summer uh, temporary exhibition uh, gallery uh, for the summer and we had the whole space and we, we made this um, part then part textile, part poetry artwork, which was um, a huge great tunnel that you could climb through with different zones that, and um, a lot sort of tent at the end that you came out of. So there was like five different zones uh, that, that went through the stages of the story and linked in with um, poems from each section. Um, it was the largest piece of work I'd ever done. Um, it totally filled my time at Ruskin and um, Caddy and I sort of developed a long-term working relationship from that, that we're kind of dipping in and out of other projects as well. And it was just the most amazing thing. Um, it had sort of smaller artworks within the larger artworks. It was very interactive. And it had hundreds of uh, people of all ages uh, go through it during that summer. Um, and it was, it was an amazing project, but it just all started with a chance meeting and um, the original Hans Christian Andersen's um, uh, story that, that, that kind of sp sparked our imagination and, and uh, began this whole kind of uh, just like journey, I guess, like this, this kind of textile, text and textile journey, shall we say. <laughs> so one of the things I really love about working in museums is that moment when you go from having an idea in your head to putting it in front of an audience and seeing what they do with it. Were you surprised at all by the way that people interacted with your piece? Um, do you know what? That people, people always have their own way of approaching things. I love watching visitors um, with my, my artwork. I think I selfishly make things to touch, not because I think it's important for visitors, but because I love seeing people interact with things that they think they shouldn't be allowed to touch. And um, uh, but everyone's like, oh, you're worried it's gonna get destroyed. And I'm like, if it gets destroyed, it gets destroyed. That's part of the story for me. And it also means I've failed in my job at making something robust enough for visitors in some way. Um, so I just, I love, I love seeing people. And it was really nice to come in over that summer and just see people going through and, and hear people's reactions to it. I think it, it was interesting because we designed it as a sort of den. We had this idea of, like, you know, when you're a child and you create dens and Caddy's children were quite young at this point. And so they were in that kind of den making zone. And we, so each little section, we wanted to be somewhere where you could stay and read the poems and interact with the space. Um, and it was it was interesting to see how people navigate the space um, and people of different ages navigate the space. But I think there was also this this sheer moment for me when we had a meeting, when we knew we were going to do it, when the Polar Museum had opened themselves up and said, we're going to give you the whole space for the whole summer. And I'd made this tiny scale model 
like using Playmobil figure scale, which they're not to scale. I mean, it's, it's obvious, but <laughs> actually sort of made, made it to scale and then we realized how weirdly scaled Playmobil was. And we just put it in the middle of the gallery during the meeting. And I just thought, how, how am I gonna make it big enough and robust enough? And like the shit, and everybody came in and helped at the end when we were kind of setting it in place. I had, I've got these pictures on my Flickr of like, volunteers and staff and my friends all sitting in different zones with the flaps up sewing away trying to get everything done so it was interesting to see how not just volunteers but how staff reacted through the project as well um and it was just it was just amazing i, I wish i could have watched people longer in the galleries because i was generally just coming in doing a bit of maintenance and then rushing off to another project so I could have just sat like a fly on the wall and watched them the whole time. Um, but especially children, because children are just so honest and they would just like, we designed it as a slow paced, like, like, like well-being experience. And they would just zoom through and laugh and then come out, run back to the front and zoom through again. And you'd see the whole tent shaking with them giggling and mucking about in there. And it's just amazing because they were just like, yeah this this is this is how you use it i know that you're the artist but this is how it's it's done and that was great you know um we designed these escape hatches in case anyone had a moment and needed to be kind of get out and um it was more a case of uh like them popping out to just see what was going on it was great how about with the museum so it's before i worked at the polar museum it sounds like by the end everyone was completely on board but were there any wobbly moments where you thought oh <laughs> what have we pitched and are they <laughs> are they really on board with this um do you know what i think generally the staff were especially the education staff and the curatorial staff were really kind of quite um open-minded and excited and brilliant because i think if they hadn't been i don't know if caddy and i would have had the confidence i think perhaps some of the people that were researching within the library would see what we were doing or see us carrying things in or setting up temporary and, and be like what is going on because there's some really serious researchers doing really serious research and then there's this kind of like airy fairy like um flapping around giggling in the archives like taking pictures of the most randomest things because i was always inspired by like the outside of the boxes and like random bits around the edges thinking like who are these people and what are they doing so i think maybe maybe they might have made us think oh gosh you know how are people who are just coming and navigating the space gonna um interpret it but um it was really nice actually on the opening night when we had a little uh caddy read her poems and I did a little talk about how it came together to hear people was like sitting down and talking about it academically as well because it was certainly a turning point for me um, because it was shortly after that that um, I sort of thought about doing my PhD and, and started on that path but I realised that actually something like this it, it can be interactive and fun and educational but it can also be um, part of uh, a wider kind of arts and wellbeing discussion and research in its own right so I don't think there was ever any a moment where I thought the staff were not on board. It was more a case that they were kind of like, you could do this. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly there were other people within the building that were like, what are these artists doing? But that, I, I love that. I love the fact that Poland Museum has got this great mix um, of serious scientific research and incredibly knowledgeable people and then artists who are doing their kind of practice and actually some of the most exciting moments for me have come when people who perhaps you wouldn't think would work together have kind of met and talked about research and art and that things just come together because there's just so many levels as an artist you're just constantly searching for inspiration mm -hmm. and it's filled with these people who have like great depths of knowledge about all kinds of interesting stuff that just sets stuff going. And I've still got unfinished bits of work from the Poland, uh, from the Snow Queen we told that I'm kind of that sit in my unfinished sewing basket that one day I hope to finish. <laughs> it's that it's that that kind of project. Yeah. So tell us a bit about um, the, the academic work you went on to do then, because you're doing a project with us now, um, recreating or inventing really Frank Debenham's coat as an interactive experience and I believe that's come from your PhD research is that 
Is that yes, right? yeah, yeah. So I've always been really interested in um, the sensory experience of dress in the museum. And I'm very much aware now that um, not perhaps so much with polar costumes, because um, they were always designed to be very robust, but certainly with a lot of popular historic dress within museums, it's no, it's no longer something that you can touch and you can hold and you can turn over. And certainly for a lot of visitors, that makes it slightly more inaccessible. But I'm also aware the magic, um, and you will be as a curator, of when you get to hold something, know its story and just think, wow! or you open a box and you find something and you think oh my goodness and I had this moment when I was just straight out of uni and I went to the Museum of London and I put like a 500 year old stomacher Elizabethan stomacher in my hands on my gloved hands and went yep there it is and it was just like oh you know and it just my whole brain just set on fire with like wow um and so I really wanted to make sure that this was an experience that was accessible to everyone. And having made lots of um, dress up costumes, replicas for museums, because that's really always been my thing. I do a little bit of sort of theater, film and telly work, but most of my costume and artwork stuff has come from museums and kind of relationships. I really wanted to explore that further. So I'm looking at one, uh, for my PhD, I looked at one really specific dress and it's an original but it's in a private collection so it's inaccessible and we know who wore it she was she actually died from consumption when she was wearing it or at least that's the story um we've got it stayed in the same family we've got letters and journals and there's just this incredible rich resource that goes with it so i've kind of embedded sound spots into a replica an exact replica and added in it's, it's quite gory i do like my gore a sort of dissection table of bits of her lungs her diseased lungs um and you can kind of navigate it and it tells the story so it's very much a sort of narrative piece but quite interactive and like that moment when you find something but as the curator you have to do all the research but with all of that done for you so you just touch the spot and then all the story comes to life so anyone can discover it. And essentially um, what the Polo Museum um, asked me to do was to kind of take my approach and then apply it to Frank Debenham's coat, this uh, coat that he was wearing when he sat on Mount Erebus and decided that you know, the, the Polo Museum, he decided the Polo Museum into being um, for the centenary. So um, we just thought it would be amazing to have this coat that tells the story. So it looks like um, an expedition coat, but it has, things in the pockets and the lining has images and embroideries and tactile and quotes and things mm -hmm. so that it's kind of the whole museum founding um, in one garment and it's quite experimental because although we're basing it on my PhD it's completely the opposite to Mary's dress which my PhD is based on which is a, a 1790s um, silk gown worn over stays by a very delicate woman um, and then we've got Frank Debenham's like kind of incredibly uh, robust and utilitarian coat um, that's seen a bit of action and kind of uh, is, 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 is ready for extreme, extreme uh, conditions. So it's quite nice to take that approach and then apply something different. And I, I really do like, I call it like weatherproof menswear, like that kind of mm -hmm. uh, very utilitarian type garment. A lot of people think that they're, especially when you're making them, they're quite hard work, but um, there's nothing more exciting for me than something that, would, that, that was specifically designed for a very uh, key purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some amazing and interesting kind of garments like the gut park, uh, cup gut parkers that you have in their collection. Um, the first time um, the conservator showed them to me, I was straight down the butchers to get some guts that I could <laughs> have a go at stitching together and work out how it was done, much to the amusement of all the Polo Museum staff. <laughs> I hadn't heard that story before. <laughs> no, well, this is just how, as an artist, it just fascinates me. And like um, the conservator was working on one, and I'd seen one before, I think, in the British Museum. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, how is it waterproof when you're stitching through it? What thread are you using? How's that done? Okay, right, I need to I need to have a go at this. I need to do some samples. And a lot of what I do never actually comes into a final thing, but it's part mm -hmm. of my thinking process and part of my artistic process to kind of explore things like guts. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I should explain for the folks at home what a gut parker is. So it's, yes. I mean, it, it's a parker like you might imagine, but it's made of seal gut or walrus gut. And it's uh, basically when you catch your walrus and you, you butcher it for the meat, but you're left with the guts. And what they would do is they'd wash them very carefully. They'd blow them up like a balloon and then dry them out and then slice along one side. And you've got these long strips of material then that you can stitch together and it's waterproof. So uh, it's like the equivalent of your um, very light uh, poncho that you get when you go on uh, the fairground uh, that folds up in a little bag, but it doesn't, it's not quite as, as practical, but for, the, for them, it's an incredibly practical waterproof garment. An uh, ideal for kayaking out off the coast of Greenland or wherever. Yes, and, and for a maker, for anyone who's stitched anything, it's just, it blows your mind that that's a standard traditional cultural process and it's mm -hmm. just something that I had to... I had to have a go at. <laughs> Brilliant. So we're really looking forward to receiving Frank's coat when you've come up with it and using it to tell the story of why why the Institute was founded. Again, with a bit of background for the people watching. Um, Frank Debenham went to the Antarctic with Captain Scott and uh, during an ascent of Mount Erebus, the story is that he thought, what we need is we need an HQ for the polar explorers so we can all come together and share our findings. And thus the idea for the Scott Polar Research Institute and the Polar Museum was born um, and we're really keen to share that and really fascinated ourselves to see how once we're allowed to do things in person again how we share that coat with people and how they do interact with it um, so yeah it's a learning process for everyone involved really and I think that's what makes it exciting from our point of view. Absolutely and in the meantime we're going to try and capture as much of the process as we can so until we can share it in person that we can share the making of and the thought process behind um, your social media team and uh, PR team are all on how we're going to kind of share that in process, which is quite, I, I kind of guess it's a good thing that's come out of the situation is that we're thinking about how we can share things differently and, and kind of interact differently. So look on the positive side. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, great. Well, I'm going to leave it there. I just wanted to say a really big thank you. Um, we'll be sharing some pictures of the Snow Queen exhibition and also some of Caddy's poetry as part of the festival. So do look out for that. Um, thank you very much, Lindsay, for joining me. And uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoy the festival. Thank you. It was my pleasure. <laughs>